Good morning, and welcome to Tuesdays with the Pilgrim, as we continue reading C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, with Chapter 12. The reason why I ask if there were another river was this. All down one long aisle of the forest, the undersides of the leafy branches had begun to tremble with dancing light, and on earth I knew nothing so likely to produce this appearance as the reflected lights cast upward from moving waters. A few moments later I realized my mistake. Some kind of procession was approaching us, and the light came from the persons who comprised it. First came bright spirits, not the spirits of men, who danced and scattered flowers, soundlessly falling, lightly drifting flowers, though by the standards of the ghost world each petal would have weighed a hundredweight, and their fall would have been like a crashing of boulders. Then on the left and right, at each side of the forest avenue, came youthful shapes, boys upon one hand and girls upon the other. If I could remember their singing and write down the notes, no man who read the score would ever grow sick or old. Between them went musicians, and after these a lady in whose honor all of this was being done. I cannot now remember whether she was naked or clothed, if she were naked, then it must have been the most visible penumbra of her courtesy and joy which produced in my memories the illusion of a great and shining train that followed her across the happy grass. If she were clothed, then the illusion of nakedness is doubtless due to the clarity with which her innermost spirit shone through the clothes. For the clothes in that country are not a disguise. The spiritual body lives along each thread and turns them into living organs. A robe or a crown is there as much one of the weaver's features as a lip or an eye. But I have forgotten, and only partly do I remember the unbearable beauty of that face. Is it? Is it? I whispered to my guide. Not at all, he said. It's someone you'll never have ever heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived at Golders Green. She seems to be, well, a person of particular importance. Aye, she is one of the great ones. Ye have heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. And who are these gigantic people? Look, they're like emeralds, who are dancing and throwing flowers before her. Haven't she read your Milton? A thousand liveried angels lackeyed her. And who are all these young men and women on each side? They are her sons and daughters. She must have a very large family, sir. Every young man or boy that met her became her son, even if it was only the boy that brought the meat to her back door. Every girl that met her was her daughter. Isn't that a bit hard on their own parents? No, there are those that steal other people's children, but her motherhood was of a different kind. Those on whom it fell went back to their natural parents, loving them more. Few men looked on her without becoming, in a certain fashion, her lovers. But it was the kind of love that made them not less true, but truer, to their own wives as well. But how? But, hello, what are all these animals? A cat, two cats, dozens of cats, and all these dogs. Why, I, I can't count them. And birds, and the horses? They are her beasts. Did she keep sort of a zoo? I mean, this is a bit too much. Every beast and bird that came near her had its place in her love. In her they became themselves. And now the abundance of life she has in Christ from the Father flows over into them. I looked at my teacher in amazement. Yes, he said. It is like when you throw a stone into a pool, and the concentric waves spread out further and further. Who knows where it will end? Redeemed humanity is still young. It has hardly come to its full strength. But already there is joy enough in the little finger of a great saint, such as yonder lady, to waken all the dead things of the universe into life. While we spoke, the lady was steadily advancing towards us. But it was not at us she looked. Following the direction of her eyes, I turned and saw an oddly shaped phantom approaching, or rather two phantoms, a great tall ghost, horribly thin and shaky, who seemed to be leading on a chain another ghost no bigger than an organ grinder's monkey. The taller ghost wore a soft black hat, 
and he reminded me of something that my memory could not quite recover. Then, when he had come within a few feet of the lady, he spread out his lean, shaky hand, flat on his chest with the fingers wide apart, and exclaimed in a hollow voice, At last! All at once I realized what it was he had put me in mind of. He was like a seedy actor of the old school. Darling, at last! said the lady. Good heavens, thought I, surely she can't. And then I noticed two things. In the first place, I noticed that the little ghost was not being led by the big one. It was the dwarfish figure that had held the chain in its hands and the theatrical figure that wore the collar around its neck. In the second place, I noticed that the lady was looking solely at the dwarf ghost. She seemed to think it was the dwarf who had addressed her, or else she was deliberately ignoring the other. On the poor dwarf, she turned her eyes. Love shone not from her face only, but from all of her limbs, as if it were some liquid in which she had just been bathing. Then, to my dismay, she came nearer. She stooped down and kissed the dwarf. It made one shudder to see her in such close contact with that cold, damp, shrunken thing. But she did not shudder. Frank, she said, before anything else, forgive me for all I ever did wrong and for all I did not do right since the very first day we met. I ask your pardon. I looked properly at the dwarf for the first time now, or perhaps when he received her kiss he became a little more visible. One could just make out the sort of face he must have had when he was a man, a little oval freckled face with a weak chin and a thin wisp of unsuccessful mustache. He gave her a glance, but not a full look. He was watching the tragedian out of the corner of his eyes. Then he gave a little jerk to the chain, and it was the tragedian, not he, who answered the lady. There, there, said the tragedian. We'll say no more about it. We all make mistakes. With the words, there came over his features a ghastly contortion, which I think was meant for an indulgently playful smile. We'll say no more, he continued. It's not myself I'm thinking about, it's you. That is what has been continually on my mind all these years, the thought of you. You were here alone, breaking your heart about me. But now, said the lady to the dwarf, you can set all that aside. Never think like that again. It is all over. Her beauty brightened so that I could hardly see anything else and under that sweet compulsion the dwarf really looked at her for the first time. For a second I thought he was growing more like a man. He opened his mouth. He himself was going to speak this time. But oh, the disappointment when the words came. You missed me? He croaked in a small bleating voice. Yet even then she was not taken aback. Still the love and courtesy flowed from her. Dear, you will understand about that very soon, she said. But today, what happened next gave me a shock. The dwarf and the tragedian spoke in unison, not to her, but to one another. You'll notice, they warned one another, she hasn't answered our question. I realized then that they were one person, or rather that both were the remains of what had once been a person. The dwarf again rattled the chain. You missed me, said the tragedian to the lady, throwing a dreadful theatrical tremor into his voice. Yes, dear, said the lady, still attending exclusively to the dwarf. You may be happy about that and about everything else. Forget all about it forever. And really, for a moment, I thought the dwarf was going to obey, partly because of the outlines of his face had become a little clearer and partly because the invitation to all joy, singing out of her whole, being like a bird song on an April evening, seemed to me such that no creature could resist it. Then the dwarf hesitated, and then, once more, he and his accomplice spoke in unison. Of course it would be rather fine and magnanimous not to press the point, they said to one another, but can we be sure she'd notice? We've done these sorts of things before. There was the time when we let her have the last stamp in the house to write to her mother, and said nothing, although she had known we wanted to write a letter ourselves. We thought she'd remember and see how unselfish we'd been, but she never did. And there was a time, oh, lots and lots of times. So the dwarf gave a shake of the chain, and, I can't forget it, cried the tragedian. 
and I won't forget it either. I could forgive them all they've done to me, but for your miseries... Oh, don't you understand, said the lady? There are no miseries here. Do you mean to say, answered the dwarf, as if this new idea had made him quite forget the tragedian for a moment, do you mean to say you've been happy? Didn't you want me to be? But no matter. Want it now, or don't think about it at all. The dwarf blinked at her. One could see an unheard-of idea trying to enter his little mind. One could even see that there was for him some sweetness in it. For a second, he had almost let the chain go. Then, as if it were his lifeline, he clutched it once more. Look here, said the tragedian. We've got to face this. He was using his manly, bullying tone this time, the one for bringing women to their senses. Darling, said the lady to the dwarf, there's nothing to face. You don't want me to have been miserable for misery's sake. You only think I must have been if I loved you. But if you'll only wait, you'll see that isn't so. Love, said the tragedian, striking his forehead with his hand. Then a few notes deeper. Love? Do you know the meaning of the word? How should I not, said the lady. I am in love. In love, do you understand? Yes, now I love truly. You mean, said the tragedian, you mean you, you did not love me truly in the old days? Only in a poor sort of way, she answered. I have asked you to forgive me. There was little real love in it. But what we call love down there was mostly the craving to be loved. In the main, I loved you for my own sake, because I needed you. And now, said the tragedian, with a hackneyed gesture of despair, now you need me no more? But of course not, said the lady, and her smile made me wonder how both the phantoms could remain from crying out with joy. What needs could I have, she said. Now that I have all, I am full now, not empty. I am in love himself, not lonely. Strong, not weak. You shall be the same. Come and see. We shall have no need for one another now. We can begin to love truly. But the tragedian was still striking attitudes. She needs me no more, no more, no more, he said in a choking voice to no one in particular. Would to God, he continued, but he was now pronouncing it good. Would to good that I had seen her laying dead at my feet before I heard those words, lying dead at my feet, lying dead at my feet. I do not know how long the creature intended to go on repeating the phrase, for the lady put an end to that. Frank, Frank, she cried in a voice that made the whole wood ring. Look at me, look at me. What are you doing with that great ugly doll? Do let go of the chain, send it away. It is you I want. Don't you see what nonsense it's talking? Merriment danced in her eyes. She was sharing a joke with the dwarf right over the head of the tragedian. Something not at all unlike a smile struggled to appear on the dwarf's face. For he was looking at her now. Her laughter was past his first defenses. He was struggling hard to keep it out, but already with imperfect success. Against his will, he was even growing a little bigger. Oh, you great goose, she said. What is the good of talking like that here? You know as well as I do that you did see me lying dead years and years ago, not at your feet, of course, but on a bed in a nursing home. A very good nursing home it was, too. Matron would never have dreamed of leaving bodies lying about on the floor. It's ridiculous for that doll to try to be impressive about death here. It just won't work. And that's the end of chapter 12. Next week, we'll continue with chapter 13. Until then, take care, stay safe, and God bless.